Dear friends, grace, mercy, and peace are yours from the one who welcomes all at the table. Amen. So in preparation for today's sermon, I've been thinking a lot about insiders and outsiders. I've wondered about those in history who were considered outcasts or outsiders, or those in present times who are considered outcasts or outsiders. A number of people come to mind throughout time, people whose skin color or nationality or ethnicity were somehow considered less than women, the LGBTQIA plus community, children, the very old, the very young, the disability community, those who cannot speak, those who cannot hear, those who cannot see. Much of who is the outsider depends on who is the insider. These thoughts just rattled around in my head and heart for most of the week because we have a really thorny gospel reading today. It involves an outsider, a Canaanite woman and her daughter, who is tormented, the text says, by a demon. So this wasn't just a person with one strike against them. In the culture of that day, the Canaanite woman was a person with three strikes against her. She was an outsider because she was a Canaanite. Jesus and his followers would have considered her an outsider, an outcast. And for a woman to come to Jesus with such boldness, also unheard of. Women did not approach men, and certainly not in a demanding way, and certainly not men who had a following. And to persist in shouting after him, especially when he ignored her, unheard of. And the disciples urged Jesus, send her away because her shouting is bothering us. But she is a mother with a child who needs help. Now what I want Jesus to do is I want her to turn readily to her. I want Jesus to turn readily to her with the help that she needs, the help that she knows he is capable of giving. Word of his ability to heal had spread she knows that he can do what she asks of him. What I want Jesus to do is to gather that daughter into his arms and send that demon away and comfort that mother and invite them to supper. What Jesus does is something entirely different. He calls the woman a dog. And he tells her that it is not fair to give what belongs to his people to her and to her people. He clearly identifies her as an outcast, an outsider. And more than that, he does it in a way that I find to be quite unchrist like. Friends, this is a hard reading. I wish it were one that they had not included in the lectionary, but here we are. Scholars have turned themselves inside out to offer some sort of corrective, some sort of understandable reason that Jesus would respond in this way. And I'm going to give you my thoughts on that in a moment. But first, I want us to turn to the reading from Isaiah today, because it speaks to some helpful context around insiders and outsiders and their place in the kingdom of God. The prophet Isaiah is writing of the extraordinary welcome that God offers to all people, even to outsiders. And in this case, Isaiah mentions two groups specifically, foreigners and eunuchs. These two groups would epitomize the outcast to the Israelites, who at this time were coming back from exile and learning what community would mean. 
So for God to recognize foreigners and eunuchs would be unheard of. For God to include them would be unthinkable. And yet, Isaiah says, the eunuchs who were completely without power in this society would be named better than sons and daughters and children. Better than God's own offspring. They will be given a new name that will stand forever and they will never be banished again. Never again will they be separated. Never again will they be outcast. And Isaiah says the same is true of the foreigner. In their belonging to God, they will be brought to God's holy mountain and be made joyful in prayer. And in this, they will exemplify a foundational truth that God's house is to be a house of prayer for all people. Not some people, not just the insider people, but for all people. So today, the good news seems to be found in the Hebrew Bible reading, the Old Testament reading. Good news in the gospel seems harder to find, and that's why I think it's important that we go back there and look again. And one way that we can do this is to remember when we have encountered an outsider, maybe as a congregation or in your workplaces or just out in the world where we live and work and play. For all the years that I lived in Seattle, I didn't have to look very far to look for an outsider. Encountering the outsider was a daily occurrence in a city where the number of people living without homes was so evident and still is. I was privileged to serve with Compass Housing Alliance on their board and learn more about what it means to be unhoused and how we can respond in a Christ-like way, which includes housing and supportive services. I can tell you that the matter of those who are unhoused is complex and it's tied into so much in our society including mental illness and economic inequality and systemic racism. But the story of the outsider that stands out to me today is the story of Gage. Gage was the grandson of Carol and Darlene, who were parishioners in my first call in the heart of rural Ohio. Gage lives with profound autism what might in another time have been labeled a demon. Now we know better. Although he struggled in structured settings like school and making friends was almost impossible, he was most at home in worship. And so Carol and Darlene faithfully brought him to church where they sat in the front row so that he could see and hear well. He was wrapped in his attention, and although he had multiple language delays, some of his earliest words and sentences were pieces of the liturgy. So when you would encounter Gage out in town or at a football game or at the grocery store, it was not uncommon for him to say, the Lord be with you. (laughs) And of course, we would respond, and also with you. Later, Gage learned to sing the liturgy, and he could sing all of the parts, including the pastor's part, so he would just sing with me when I sang the part, which was great. This could be a lovely, feel-good story of someone whose challenges named them as outcast, and it could be a reminder to us of how We are to be in community and as communities of faith how we are to respond. And it could illustrate the hope that our congregations are safe places for those that society calls other. But like most stories, it became complicated by more hard things. As he grew in years and his size grew, Gage had run-ins with the law, He spent time in psychiatric units when he became particularly unmanageable. 
and today he lives in a group home and on occasion and with supervision can visit his faithful grandmothers. I got to see him when I was in Ohio a couple of weeks ago because he was there for his birthday and he greeted me with, the Lord be with you. <laughs> it is unlikely that life will ever be easy for Gage, but it is not his illness or his difficulty living in community that defines him. What defines Gage is what he remembers every time he splashes his hand in the baptismal font, that he is a child of God. And that is what makes him well, and that is what makes him whole, or to borrow Jesus' language today, great is Gage's faith. Which brings us back to the Canaanite woman and Jesus. What do we do with a story where Jesus appears to be clueless at best and heartless at worst? Again, some scholars try to nuance the language and others suggest maybe he was testing the disciples. It is hard to call out the shortcomings of the Son of God. But here we are with a story that on its face appears to teach us of something about persistence. The Canaanite woman persists in her pleas for mercy in the face of one who appears not to hear. But this is not the God that we know in Jesus. Jesus was always with the outcast. He was always with the oppressed and the marginalized. So to make sense of this story, we have to remember the other instances in Jesus' life and ministry where he was learning about the true nature of his mission. So think about him as a 12-year-old boy in the temple, and he, and he stays behind while his mom and dad and the whole community go home so that he can learn more about God. Think of him at the wedding at Cana, where his mother had to urge him to intervene when the wine ran out to show that he had power to provide. And so in a similar way, when he encounters the Canaanite woman, what Jesus comes to learn and know and understand and really inhabit is how wide his mission really is. That he was actually not just called to the people of Israel, but called to all, especially those who were labeled outcasts to the eunuchs, to the foreigners, to the Canaanites, to Gage, to you and to me. This portion of the Gospel of Matthew marks a turning point in Matthew. It places Jesus in a foreign land and in a confrontation with an outsider. And it answers the questions that the earliest hearers would have. Who is this Gospel for? Who is God's mercy for? And the answer is clear. It extends farther than we can imagine. So for us, as God's people in the world today, it means we don't get to turn our heads when we meet someone in need. And I have been so blessed to just begin to get a glimpse of the ways that you all do this here. They are there are a multitude of ways that you do this here. I saw Dick with egg cartons last week, and I was like, huh, <laughs> I wonder if Lynette's sending him to the store. But you all were bringing egg cartons so that the food bank could send eggs home to those who need them. A small thing, but so important. You witness to the gospel outside of these walls in a multitude of ways. So let's keep ourselves open to the possibility that when we encounter someone who is other or outcast or outsider, that we might have something to learn from them about who Jesus is. Because friends, the kingdom of God is more than we could ever begin to imagine. It includes all people those who have been labeled outsiders, those who have been cast out, those who are oppressed. It includes those we love and those we could not imagine 
coming and sitting at a table with. But here we are at this table, this table of mercy and grace that is so wide that it encompasses the entire kingdom of God. Here, a morsel of bread and just, just a dip of wine and we receive the wide goodness of God's mercy, salvation in the body and blood of Christ, given and shed for us and for all people. And that is the good news for this day and all days. Thanks be to God, and let the church say, Amen. Amen.